Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. But we live in a funny day. Things people used to be sure of, people today question. And things people used to question, people now seem quite sure of. So, for example, uh, this weekend I've been part of the huge meeting down at RFK, Promise Keepers, in which we have 50,000 men gathering together to say things as if they're unusual when 50 years ago they would have been the accepted norm of any normal husband and father, let alone Christian man in the country. On the other hand, uh, there are many things that are now taken for granted that used to be held in question. So, for example, if you go up to most Americans and if you ask them if God loves them, well, of course he does. If you bring up the question of sin, well, they know that, of course, He's loving and forgiving. He accepts everyone, so there's just no problem. Questions that people used to puzzle over for centuries. Will God accept me? Well, they're no longer on the agenda of most people's thoughts. They're taken for granted. It's funny, in academic circles, there's deep uncertainty. You would think in the places where people know most, they know most. But they don't. Certainty is taken for mere conceit. Knowledge is taken as nothing but guesses. And on the other hand, often, popularly among people, there's either overconfidence of things that are true, like what we were just thinking of, or just complete complacency and indifference about such matters, or even a false certainty. Well, the message that this little letter of Peter has to give to us this morning is about four certainties that we need to know. Four things about which we must be certain if we're to live the lives God is calling us to live. And the first certainty is that we must be certain of our call. We must be certain of our call. You see, that's what he says here in verse 10 that I just read to you, my brothers. Be all the more eager to make your calling and your election sure. Be all the more eager to make your calling and your election sure. Now, fundamentally, if we're going to make our calling sure, that means just be sure that we're saved, be sure that we're Christians. We have to realize, first of all, and fundamentally, that it's God's call. Do you notice how those verses that we read are just full of the fact that this is God's call? So it's not generated by ourselves. If we're Christians, no, he called us. Verse three, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by our own, by his own glory and goodness. You see, we don't call ourselves. If we're going to be certain of God's call, we have to first know that it is his call. 
And then also, you see, we have to understand not only is it not generated by ourselves, but it's not based on ourselves. No, if we're saved, it's based on Jesus Christ. So in the very first verse, you see, he says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. It's through his righteousness, not through ours. If we stand before God finally and are saved, it will not be fundamentally because of anything you or I have done. It will be through Jesus Christ, through his righteousness. So this call isn't generated by us. This call isn't based on us. This call isn't even sustained by us. Look at this in verse 3 again. He says he gives us everything we need for life and godliness. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So if we're going to make our calling and election sure, the first thing we need to know, says Peter, is that this calling is fundamentally not of us. It is God's call based on the righteousness of Christ, given, uh, given everything to us from him that we need. It's all from him. We have to understand that if we're to make our calling and election sure, as Peter tells us to. But it is God's call of us. So Peter tells them, make your election sure by these qualities. He exhorts them in verse 10. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Well, how do you do that? Well, he says there, if you keep reading in verse 10. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Apparently, we make our calling and election sure by doing. We don't save ourselves by doing. No, Peter has been very clear. We're saved by God through the righteousness of Christ. But we make our calling and our election sure, he says, there in verse 10, by doing these things. So he says up in verse 8, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Well, what are these things? What are these qualities? Well, he says there in that beautiful list in verses 5 to 7, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Peter presents Christian growth, I think, as a kind of spiral, something that the more you grow as a Christian, the more you will grow as a Christian. You were to have these qualities, he says, in increasing measure. Did you notice that in verse 8? And so if we do have these qualities in increasing measure, that brings us an assurance of our calling, of our election. I mean, is it so surprising that living as a Christian will help me to realize that I am a Christian? Will help me to be certain of the fact that I am a Christian? So God calls us through grace alone. There's no question about that. And at the same time, purity of life is an evidence of the reality of that call in our lives. It's confirmation, Peter says. It's confirmation to others and it's confirmation to yourself that you are, in fact, a Christian. So here's an example of that. I said I was at the Promise Keepers meeting yesterday. Here's my uh, armband that uh, everybody had to have on. I've left mine on deliberately just uh, for this sermon illustration. Okay, there it is. That's my armband. Now, now let's say that um, this wristband was someone else's idea, which it was. And let's say that it was paid for by someone else, which it wasn't. But let's say that it was. It's paid for by someone else. And it's given me to wear. All they want to know when I come to the stadium is, do I have it on? All they want to know is, do I have it on? If I tell them I have it on, I'm not saying it was my idea. I'm not saying even that I paid for it. Somebody else could pay for it. I'm not saying that I made it. No, it was given to me. They simply want to know, 
Do I possess it? Do I have it on? Now, we tend to associate for some reason salvation by grace with salvation as a one-time event. Have you ever thought of that? We tend to associate salvation by grace with the idea that salvation is a momentary event. And we get very nervous sometimes if we read lists of qualities that are supposed to characterize us as Christians and it tends to start sounding like salvation by works. But it's not. No, if we're saved, we're saved because of God's action in our lives. But if we are saved by God's grace, we will give evidence of it. We will show that we possess these qualities. My friend, if you are sitting here this morning as a Christian, you have faith. You are good. You have knowledge. You exhibit self-control. You exhibit perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. If you're not a Christian, trying to exhibit any of those things will not make you a Christian. You're made a Christian only by the righteousness of Christ. Only by God's grace and you trusting in Him. But if you are a Christian, you will show those things in your life. Do you see what Peter's saying? Salvation is by grace, very clearly. But if you have been saved by the grace of God, you'll look like it. Not a one of us is perfect, but every single one of us that are truly His children will be marked by these qualities. And the warning Peter wants to give to the people he's writing to, and therefore to us, is, friend, if you call yourself a Christian and you're not marked by these qualities, be careful. Be careful. You may have gotten a hold of some false teaching that makes you think you can be a Christian when your life is not marked by these things. This is the first certainty that Peter tells us we need to have. Make your own calling certain. That's why Peter wrote this letter. Make your own calling certain. Now quickly, a second one. In order to be certain of their own calling, Peter knows they'll need a second certainty, and that's the certainty of the truth. That's what he talks about at the end of this first chapter. He first of all tells them in verses 12 to 15 to remember my testimony. He says there in verse 12, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of the body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Peter wants them to remember his testimony. Because his testimony, he says, is true. If you go on and read verses 16 to 19, he says, We didn't follow cleverly invented stories. No, we're telling you things that we saw with our own eyes. We were eyewitnesses of these things. And if you look what he's an eyewitness of, verse 17, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he, Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Peter is testifying to the truth of God's testimony about Jesus. He's saying, I'm not even giving you just my own interpretation of the life of Jesus. I'm telling you what I heard God say on the Mount of Transfiguration. So I'm giving you God's testimony. And Peter's testimony is, he says, accurate. Because he remembers this. He was there. He's not just interpreting it. He's telling you what God's interpretation is. And that's why he says in verses 20 and 21 that Scripture is always God's interpretation. It's never been our own. Uh, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God has always been truthful and He's been interested in letting His people know truth. I was told that when the Soviet government was still in power, you couldn't get an accurate map of Moscow. At least not one that was printed there. Friends who lived in Moscow said that the government would regularly put out maps of Moscow that were false. They would have streets which didn't exist. They would not put on streets which did exist. That it was a typical plan. And that people who lived there very long and tried to get around on those maps 
constantly found themselves getting lost. You see, we need to know the truth if we're going to know where we are. We have to have accurate directions if we're going to have accurate bearings. And Peter knows that there is no hope of salvation, let alone of our assurance of it, if our message is not at base true. This must be settled. Thus Aaron gave that book review of Packer's Fundamentalism in the Word of God. If you have questions about the truth of the Word of God, let me encourage you to borrow that book. It's a brief book. To borrow it and read it, and I'll happily talk to you about it. But friend, you will have no certainty of your own salvation if you do not know that the basic message of Christianity is true. So Peter tells them that they must be certain of their own calling. Secondly, he tells them that they must be certain of the truth. And they need to be so certain of the truth because of a third certainty that Peter shows them. They can be certain of false teachers giving false assurance. This is what chapter 2 is about. You see, Peter's just mentioned these Old Testament prophets there. I mean, yeah, the Old Testament prophets at the end of chapter 1. And that makes him think, now, of course, there were also false prophets. There were also people claiming to be prophets of God who, in fact, were not. So he warns them of these as well. He says there in verse 1, but there were also false prophets, false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. But what are these false teachers like? Well, he says basically two things about them. First, that they're very confident spiritually, these false teachers. They're not shrinking violets. They're not people who state things carefully and equivocally, shifting back and forth unclearly. No, these false teachers are very confident. So you see in verses 10 and 11 and 12 and 13, they even mock spiritual authorities. No, these teachers are very confident. If you want a powerful leader to follow, there will be false teachers that are plenty powerful for you to follow. But more than that, not only are they very confident spiritually, they are very carnal regularly. They are very carnal regularly. Look at verse 13 and following. You see, not only do they reject the wrong authority, despise it, but they set up the wrong authority, their own desires. They follow after. They become disciples of the corrupt desires of their own flesh. So we read in chapter 2, verse 13. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These men are springs without water, mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it, and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than to have known it, and then to turn their backs on the sacred commandment that was passed on to them. Of them the proverb, proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed goes back to wallowing in the mud. You see, what these false teachers fundamentally did was disconnect holiness and salvation. They say you can be sure that you're saved, it doesn't matter how you live. You can be sure that you're saved and follow your own carnal desires. And you, do you see how that teaching is particularly dangerous? False hope is particularly dangerous. That's why he says up in verse 3 of chapter 2, they will exploit you with stories they've made up. And this heartbreaking sentence that I read to you in verse 18. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. 
are like fake doctors who set up to say that they can take care of your illness when they're just quacks. They can't. They get your hopes up and they dash them and they dash them mortally. Finally. That's, Peter says, what these false teachers are doing. Now, the unpleasant reality is that we must be discerning, even as these early Christians had to be, about false teaching. And I think these are two good signs that Peter gives us that we can look for. People who despise the true authority of God and His Word and people who live after their own carnal desires. Friend, if you see a teacher who's like that, you can assume you're looking at a false prophet. That, says Peter, is not the kind of person you should look for. You should look for the kind of person who understands the Word of God and submits themselves to it in their mind, but also then in their lives as they live according to what God has revealed, as they live honestly. So we're called to discern false teaching. More than that, we are called to figure out whether or not we are following such false teaching. That's why he writes this letter. Chapter 1, verse 10. Make your calling and election sure. He doesn't want these people to be confused by this false teaching. That's why he promises them here so clearly in chapter 3 that God will judge these false teachers. They will eventually be shown up for what they are. Just like God judged the angels who sinned, he says in in verse uh, 4. Just like He judged the ancient world, verse 5. Just like He judged Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 6. God will show the truth about these people. Even as God has borne witness to Jesus at the transfiguration that He's true, so these false teachers will be shown up for what they are. False. So this is an important warning. False prophets could give false assurance. Thinking you're elected, thinking you're called, and yet living like these false teachers. Rather than like He sets out in verse 1, in in chapter 1, in verses 5 and 6 and 7, with godliness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and brotherly kindness and love. That's the way we live if we're Christians. This other way is the way we live if we're not. So Peter says, one, be certain of your calling. Two, be certain of the truth. Three, be certain that false teachers will come leading believers in wrong ways and they will be judged. But one final certainty they needed. It's not only these particular false teachers that will be judged, Finally, they need to know that they need to be certain of God's judgment of the whole world. That's what he says in chapter 3. They need to make certain of their own salvation. You see, there were those who scoffed and who said, Oh, yes, you talk of God's judgment, but where is it? Everything has gone on just like it's always been. They say, Oh, God couldn't judge us. Peter says in chapter 3 and verse 5, Yes, he could. God created the whole world by His Word. And they say, well, perhaps He could, but He wouldn't judge us. Not not our God. He's a loving God. Peter replies in verse 6, He's willing. There is precedent for judgment. God has judged the earth before in the flood. And so he says in verse 7, the same Word of God now has reserved the heavens and the earth for judgment, not by water, but by fire. And I can just imagine the scoffers then nervously saying, well, Oh, all this is just talk. Well, he, he hasn't, after all, judged us. But for, if that's what you think, do you think just because God has not done something yet that He never will? Do you think that because God has not already done something that He won't? Do you think God is done and finished? Do you realize that the Jewish people waited thousands of years for the Messiah? During any one of those years, they could have scoffed and said, oh, he hasn't come yet, so he'll never come, but he came. And so it seems to be that the church is waiting thousands of years for his return. Does the fact that he hasn't come yet mean that he's not coming? No, says Peter. No, God hasn't forgotten. He's not forgetful, he says in verses 8 and 9. He is eternal. A thousand years is like a day to him. He's not even slow. Verse 9, he says, what you're taking as slowness is his patience with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. In fact, judgment when it does come will come suddenly. So of course you don't see it yet, he says in verse 10 of chapter 3. Therefore, he concludes the letter with an exhortation 
beginning of verse 11 of chapter 3, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. So Peter's saying that not only are these false teachers going to face judgment, but my friends, you will have to face judgment. And when you face the judgment, your false teachers will not be with you. When you face the judgment, I will not even be with you. When you face God's judgment, you will stand there alone and you will give an account for what you've done. And you will find that you are either saved in Christ or you are not saved. So he says here in this letter, as he did back in the first chapter, if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the whole thrust of this letter is to bring the certainties of truth and false teachers and of judgment to light so that these people can and will make sure of their own salvation. Now, I have to tell you, there are many Christians who think you never need to preach a sermon like this. Everybody knows whether or not they're Christians. And they can know because they can remember a certain time in the past when they made a decision. If they made that decision, they can know they're Christians. If they haven't, well, then they know they need to make that decision. But I just have to tell you, isn't it interesting when Peter writes this letter, he does not tell them once to remember a decision that they've made. He tells them to remember the truth that he told them, but he tells them most to look to their life now. Do they see these qualities in increasing measure? If they do not, there is no comfort in this word. If you do, there is comfort. Not because any of us are perfectly good or perfectly godly or perfectly loving, but because we can see something of God's activity in our lives. Because we can see something of Him changing us and making us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So friend, if I'm to bring you Peter's message this morning, I must tell you, don't look to what you think you did 17 years ago in a decision. Look to how you're living now. If you see this fruit in your character, there's good hope. And you can make your calling and election sure as Peter exhorts you to do. But if you see simply a card that was signed years ago and a life that is not marked by love, not marked by brotherly kindness, not marked by godliness, by compassion, by knowledge, by perseverance, and by self-control, then, friend, this letter has no comfort. We are saved by God's grace through Christ. We will know we're saved by the evidences we see in our lives. Peter says, make your calling and election sure. Peter's saying, check the map. Make sure somebody hasn't given you a wrong map. Make sure you're headed in the right way. Check the directions. If you have friends about this, if you have questions about this, talk to me afterwards. Talk to a, a Christian that you know, a friend about this. Search the scripture about this. Make sure that you will be saved then on that final day by making sure you see the marks of God's work in your character now. That's what Peter is saying. This is Peter's message. Be sure of this, he says. It's important to be right. It's important to be sure. It's important to be sure that you're right with God. Let's pray. Lord, we know that in the life to come, the hours that we've spent together will seem like passing moments. Lord, we know that You see so clearly into us in ways that we don't even see ourselves. So we know that Peter has to write a letter like this to encourage us to try to look clearly at ourselves because it's not always clear to us. So Lord, we pray that by Your Holy Spirit, You'd be teaching the truth of this letter to each one of us. Father, I pray that there's not one within the sound of my voice that will not labor to make their calling and election sure. We praise You that salvation is by grace. And we praise You for the truth of the fact that if we are saved by Your grace, we will live as gracious people. Lord, give us the help of Your Spirit in looking to ourselves and in knowing the truth about ourselves. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.